Good morning, everyone, and it, I'm delighted to be here at the CDN Live, and we can wonder what the CTO of Ericsson is doing here. Now, one reason could be that Cadence is a major supplier and partner for us to develop many parts of our systems that we do, but it's not. The reason I'm here is because of you. You are all building what we call the Network Society, and the Network Society is based on that anything, anything in the world that can benefit from a connection will have one. I'm going to talk a little bit and take you on a journey of where we are in all that transformation. Tom already mentioned this tremendous change that industry after industry in the world is going through. Ericsson as a company is also a startup. You think of us as a startup, I'm sure you do that. It's just that we started in 1876. But we started in a garage, and that's very important. If you're a startup, you have to start in a garage. 13 square meters in Stockholm, of all places. A guy named Lars Magnus Ericsson started our company. He had a vision and a dream. And that is that communication is a basic human need. And he was right about that. He was fascinating by the space shuttles of the time. And they were not flying objects at that time. It was things like the telegraph and eventually the telephone, which was invented the same year by a Scottish guy, Graham Alexander Bell. He went from all that voice communication on a journey which is taking Ericsson into new territories all the time and helping us with what we think is to lead the evolution of networks into the network society era. Now, what have we done? Mobile telephony was a tremendous, tremendous innovation that we did. And how did that come about? Because computerized stored switching. So switches was transformed from mechanical switching into computers. And that happened in the 1960s. Um, that led, as many things do, from one thing to another. That meant that we could start to look at cellular systems that was powered by those computers and which today became mobile telephony. That has helped Ericsson to build some 600 networks globally with this kind of technology. And today we are the leading vendor in the world of building mobile systems in the world. But that is not it. It has led to something else, which is a society changing thing. These are some numbers just as we exited last year where we were at. Five exabytes of data produced in all mobile systems in the world. Exabytes is a, is a very large number. Huh? How much of that is voice? Only 300 petabytes. For you who are engineers, you know that that's an order of magnitude, thousand lower, but it's, it's very little voice. All voice communication that a person produces in a month is about 20 megabytes. That's all it does in terms of data. And you know that a normal subscription on a smartphone lies on the level of gigabytes now. Two, three gigabytes on a world average. World total communication is about five exabytes. 65% of the world's population today, all the people in the world, are covered by mobile broadband, which is a very high number. This is transforming people's lives. And this is 3G that has that reach. We can have the same access as anyone else in the world if we live in Africa to uh, documents that are produced in the most advanced schools at Harvard or at Stanford. And that same document can be read by anyone and understood, if they can read it and understand it, as well as the most advanced engineer living just outside Stanford School or working on the campus. That is the transformation factor that we are in front of. And this has just happened in a very, very short time. 40% of the world's population has access to 4G systems, which is really somewhere in the order of magnitude, 150 mega, megabits per second in speed. It's a lot of speed. It's actually more fast than your optical fiber perhaps going into your home. It has also led to some fantastic number in terms of subscriptions. We have today around 7.3 billion mobile subscriptions in the world. Now, there are only 4.6 billion subscribers because many people have more than one device. 
most of people in this room perhaps belong to that group. It has also led to smartphone success. A fruit company in California that was mentioned before invented a new device a few years back that started to transform everyone's ability to compute in their hand. Apple did, was a transformation factor when it comes to what could be done in terms of access to knowledge and access to, to, uh, to anything that can make your life more, more easy. I do believe that many of those changes are also behind the movements of people in the world today. It's behind a lot of things that are happening in terms of, of uh, democratic movements or other things going on. I'm not an expert on that, but I'm sure that that has a very big impact on the geopolitical situation more than we think. We had 3.4 billion smartphones in the world as we exited last year and on a tremendous growth curve. And then you can see the number that counts for you, the billions of connected devices that are coming into the networks and changing the way we do things. If we extrapolate this to 2021, we will have 11 times more data traffic. We will pass 50 billion exabytes or 50 exabytes of data in the, in the world on the mobile systems. We will have 90% population coverage of mobile broadband. And LTE by the time will have reached about 70% or 75% of the world's population. Why is that so significant? Because it's an enormous coverage. This gives the opportunity for almost everyone in the world to use this kind of technology and these devices. But it has an even more significant impact on the network society. Because this means that anything that can have a microchip in it and that can be connected and communicate will start to transform the way we do things. And that's why I think that we are just on the brink of an enormous change. The smartphone will still be significant, and you can see here that in the next years we will almost double the amount of smartphones in the world, which is also a very big game changer in this. But this biggest change is not on the number of smartphones. It's really what the network society, when all these chips and microelectronics and smart devices start to be connected by the same network. You can talk about really the next generation of internet. And this next generation of internet will require a new type of network, and that's what I'm also going to explain to you more about. Now, there are three components that you can remember if everyone ever asks you, what are the biggest transformers that are making its way in terms of technology that are building this new change or this new future? One is mobility in itself. Mobility means that anything that is moving or is anywhere can be connected. So the mobility component as such is an extremely important component. That's why people pay so much for spectrum out there. And that's why operators are looking at so many new business models and opportunities. But that's also why the whole automotive sector is changing and anything that's moving, including us humans. The other one is broadband. And of course, that's data, the data revolution. And all of you know all about that. Data is transforming the way we handle data, the way we can program things, learning and understanding things that are way beyond the system we're building is a big transforming factor. And then you have the computing. Computing from distribution into a centralized computing and a horizontal computing. And horizontal computing means both central as well as computing at the edge and the balance between the two. These three changes are the ones that build up what we call the fifth technology revolution. One thing to remember in technology revolutions, and the fifth one here is counting from a long time ago. So we did some research together with, with uh, London's uh, Business School of Economics and so on, how big revolutions affect our lives. There is a scholar there, Colotta Perez, who wrote a book about this, and she's the one who came up with the fifth technology revolution. But one thing that she is teaching, and which is a very important learning, is that when there is a big technology revolution, like the introduction of steam engines, they were invented to pump water out of mines. But the companies that launched those products and introduced these technology were not the ones who found out the real usage. 
other people figured very soon out that they could, uh, could uh, totally transform the way we transport people. Railroads, eventually cars, everything came out of that. So that means that every technology revolution has an installment phase, you can say, where big investments are being done, bubbles of investors come in, we have seen that, uh, optical fibers, if anyone was part of that, big bubbles come of investors, of venture cap, of capital, bubble burst, technology gets real, and the real usage comes in place. And the winners in the first phase are not at all necessarily the winners in the second phase. Everybody heard that Kodak was part of innovating digital imaging. That didn't benefit them so much. That means that we have to prepare for a world where we can understand the new transformative technology changes in a way that we can become winners on the other side. This is affecting our company very much. And let me by this illustrate that we need to live in a world now where the network society, the reality of what you are innovating, the reality of those packages, chips, boards, solutions that you are looking for in a distributed, completely distributed computer, computerized and data intensive and artificial intelligence intensive world, those are the ones that will affect how we build applications on higher levels and eventually how we build complete networks and how we build all of this together. This is an enormous transformation. From a technology point of view, I don't think anyone has seen anything yet compared to what this really does. Isolated industries from each other are merging together. I'm glad to be here in Munich today in your conference to be able to say and talk about what I believe. But at the same time, I will also meet a, a, a few manufacturers of automotive that are here in Munich. It happens to be one of the most important clusters in the world of automotive. And their industry is dramatically changing because they are all of a sudden related to a network guy like me. And they're looking for new technology to transform and change. And if you look at the networks of the world, they've gone through this journey. Now, on this scale here, is the number of, of, uh, of connections in the world, or the number of people. And you remember then when we started there, 1875, 76, that's where we started. So we spent almost 100 years connecting a little bit less than a billion people. That's fixed telephony. When I started in Ericsson some 25 years ago, that was a very big thing. Oh, fixed, you know, this is the whole thing, off hook, on hook. Very important technologies. Little did I know. Mobile telephony had already started to grow, even though it was not bigger yet, but very soon surpassed and became the success I talked about. Become 7.4, 7.3 billion subscriptions in the world. Smartphones three, past 3 billion. And then comes the Internet of Things, the network society, the society where everything that can benefit from a connection will have one. And I think we are then decided and determined to make the next generation of networks tailor-made for this kind of, of uh, development. Here you can see all the revolutions of mobile telephony from the very first introduction. In 1980, it was launched as a rich man's machine, where, you know, a very few... If you had one, you had to show all your friends that you had one. That's where it started. When I started with Ericsson in 1990, we had determined already that we will make it everybody's machine. We were working on something called personal communication systems, which would give everyone in the whole world the ability to talk on the phone and walk at the same time. Which at that time was mind-boggling. People said, wow, that is really a strong vision. And now we've gone to making that into a computer, the smartphone, and now we're on the next journey where we're connecting everything in the world that can contain a microprocessor and a microprocessing capability. 5G has a number of use cases that are coming out, and maybe some of you have seen Verizon or the Olympics in Korea or Entity Docomo in Japan going out saying, we're going to launch 5G, you're going to be first. So everybody's fighting to be first. Ericsson is trying to hold all of this together with our partners because this is an industry that is based, as Tom said earlier, very much on standards. And the standards is what's making it possible to connect so many things because the standards is inherent in the whole telecommunications world. It's built on that from the beginning. Two phones can't talk to each other, it's not much of value. The telecom paradigm is that every device that's added into a standardized ecosystem adds value to all the already existing devices. Pretty fascinating idea, and it still works. 
So the idea is, of course, to bring a standard that can make connectivity for all kinds of use cases that are now industrial use cases. As Tom said, the rise of the machines. Scary, but if we handle it right, it can be of enormous benefit to take humanity and our big challenges to the next level. It will be sensors everywhere, and the sensor technology is exploding. We have something called the Internet of Things that is powered then for new standards that are narrowband IoT and so on on the radio side. Broadband and media everywhere. An iPad is nothing like a big television. It's the same thing, same product in 5G. The first use cases that we are building is actually for media. Verizon is going to provide 4K television through 5G technology. Smart vehicles has already been talked about here. Infrastructure, monitoring and control, smart cities, every part of infrastructure. This has to have very low latencies. Many of these cases are based on low latencies, high throughput, low power consumption and all those big challenges. Critical control of remote devices is the one that requires the most low latencies. We're actually looking now at latencies end-to-end -end from the cloud to the device of something in the range of two to three uh, milliseconds, which is very, very low. And that makes it possible to remote control robotics in a factory. And I was in a very interesting discussion with another company that is based in Switzerland. No hints. Big company about remote controlling robotics and remote controlling mine devices that are running in, in, in big mines, dangerous environments for people to work in. The last case here I put here is, is, is something called human interaction. Haptic. Do you know what haptic is? It gives you immediate feedback. With this kind of technology, we can have immediate feedback from a system. And in your case, you might make a microprocessor that you build into something, and on a totally different device, which is just connected over the same network, you get a haptic feedback control from what you're doing on one side. That is not so easy to do. But that is what these kind of systems will do as we build 5G. And the number of use cases that we have for this is just tremendous. We can have everything from process control, factories, cell automation. We can look at the metering, smart grids is a very big application. Transport, automotive, we talked about already. Remote assistance, we're looking at, at everything on the planet. Part of Ericsson Research is now working with shipping, with airplanes, with all kinds of devices being connected in one way or another in order to do this. And it will transform the way that these industries operate and work today. Some of the key technology trains, and now I'm so happy that Tom gave the speech he did this morning because he talked about the security, for example, which is my bullet number two here. Because that's a very big challenge in all of this. If we can't make it secure, it just won't happen. People will just say no. So there is a human aspect of what we're doing. We're not crazy. And that means they have to... Security here encapsulates the whole safety. It's not only about hacking, it's about uh, the liability and reliability, the resilience of systems, and so forth. Performance is, though, the number one. If we can't make it perform, it will not happen. There would be no Netflix in this world if it was not possible to distribute pictures home with a good quality. And the only thing, reason that networks happened, Netflix happened was that the networks were good enough to do it. So there is an always limiting factor in networks and the connectivity in order to connect the clouds to the devices. Internet evolution is another very big, important topic. The Internet in itself has to evolve. IP has to evolve, and Ericsson is engaged in a number of research projects very close with our biggest partner that is really close to us now, which is Cisco, where we are working on the evolution of, of network technology to be able to evolve this. At the same time, there is a big debate in the world who should own the Internet. And that is an even more complex topic that I don't have time to go into, but this is very, very interesting. The enterprise is changing. Bring your own device was one trend. Today, you don't need to have anything on premise on, in an enterprise. And all enterprise industry will dramatically change because of this. And that means that whole enterprise property and what they do and what they build will softwareize, become software. And as that happens, it moves into the cloud. And so it's an enormous change of the way we look at companies. Think about that and what it does to your business. 
Spectrum, I've already talked about, people pay gazillion tons. It's a limited resource in this world. And as mobility was one of those key factors, you can understand that it will become even more scarce. And it's a good business to be in to make base stations and other equipment for Spectrum. So that's why we're continuing to invest there. Uh, and we work, need to work with very strong partners to make us very efficient on that. Access, connectivity, horizontalization. All systems in the world become layered and horizontalized. Why is that so important and good? It is so important and good because they become decoupled. And if they are decoupled, they can move at different speeds. So the vertically integrated system, like the space shuttle that Tom was showing, was awful because it was totally vertically integrated and you could not change anything because you, you changed the, the whole thing. But with the horizontalization of technology, we move out of that. So that's one other important learning apart from the, from the structures and the architectures and the modularization. Cloud, I don't even need to explain how much it means. To our company, it means that we have to build huge data centers to support our customers. And we're working with Amazon and we're working with many others to build the global cloud structure that will be needed for the future for these technology de development. Industry after industry after industry goes through this translation. And the media industry is one of the first and earliest to be transforming. I was at NEB in Las Vegas last week to speak about the transformation in the, in the media industry. They are now looking at how everything in the media industry will go into the cloud and how that will totally transform the way that television or any entertainment is built and how that will translate in itself into what is called industrial media or industrial television. is where you will put virtual reality or virtual imaging on any device out there and bring it all together and use the same kind of technologies that's been used for entertainment but now for industrial purposes. Enormous change in that area. And it all affects the network and it all affects the devices and all affects the applications and what's built on the chips out there. It's also transformed our company tremendously. This is just a picture of where we come from in the telecom industry. If I go back 15 years, 16 years, we were many, many, many competitors. All my competitors are gone, almost. It's only me, Huawei and Nokia left on the traditional telecom space. The rest have been eaten in one way. It's longer and longer names, right? Alcatel and Nokia. That has become... And new players have emerged. If you look back at that time, my Chinese competitors was almost not there. It's a very transformative industry. And I can see on my business mix, I used to be a lot more hardware, about two-thirds hardware and one-third software. And today in the business mix, we're two-thirds software and services and one-third hardware. We spend 90% of our R&D on software. And it's a very big transition also to the engineering skills and the parts of Ericsson when we build this. And if you just take a very quick glance at our company, today we are about $33 billion company. We spend $5 billion on R&D, which is 14% of the turnover, which is a large amount, just to stay alive in this business and to be able to build these new networks of the future. We have about, here it says 37, but we have around 39,000 essential patents. We take about 3,000 essential patents per year. So it's an enormous machine that we're running on the R&D side. We have about 25,000 R&D engineers, and we support and run about 1 billion subscriptions, so we're an operator as well. And we have about 65,000 people on our services arm. So can large companies change? They certainly can. Last year, we hired 14,000 people and we fired 15,000 people. It's an enormous change. Why are we changing so much? I already gave you the reason. We have to. Because the opportunity of building the future of the network society for us is so important. And you can see our main parts, network, IT. We build big IT systems for operation and maintenance. Media, as I talked about very big part of Ericsson today, and industries, and industry and society, and the collaboration with many of you through the Internet of Things. This means that we are moving into a completely new economic logic as well. Anything, if anything, that can benefit from a connection will have one. It means that every resource in the world can start to be shared. 
If you look at car companies, and I met the CTO of a very big car company, very famous one the other day, and he said, you know, in, in 20 years we will not be selling cars, but we will still make cars. We will sell transportation, and we need to transform our business into that. There's no point in having a car which is 95% or even more of the time is not used, actually. It's parked. Have you thought about that? How many here own a car? Uh, there's a lot of people who own a car. I can tell you we don't need but 10% of the amount <laughs> if we were sharing all the rides in this room. So it's an enormous transformation. And the younger generation, they, are, they love Uber and they love the shared economy. There is nothing as meaningless. How many in here own a chainsaw? Well, that was a cup three, yeah. It's the most meaningless product that you can own. I think, you know, you lose, you use a chainsaw one hour every two years, and then you're scared of even using it. And most likely, you would be much better off someone else using it. And it's a generation question. I mean, we, my generation, unfortunately, like to own things. But the new generation don't want to own any chainsaws. They want to just be able to cut down trees. And therefore, there is an enormous change coming about that. So the, to, to that side, you see the product models, the physical resources, the hierarchical relationships that we're used to buying the chainsaw from the shop there, going home. You know, that's hierarchical. We're moving into service models with virtualized resources. All chainsaws in the world belong to the same group. You just order one. Who cares how many there are? but they do the job. And we move into symbiotic relationships. And it's because of the users, as I say, the generation shift, but it's also because of the things and the connections and the microprocessor development and what you are here to do in this conference. And it's because of data, and we talked about the data and the use of data and the new storage techniques, for example, together with compute, that will change the way we can handle data real time on a processor combined with storage and also because of platforms, and platforms are becoming global. The Uber platform is a global platform. You have to think global from the moment you start your business. If you don't, you're old school. You're thinking the way we used to think. And let me just finish up by some little, little, little devices or advices from someone who sits in the middle of this, as I do and as our company does. It's about expanding the community. And I already see that you really understand that because you're all here in this room now. That's an expanded community. You represent a lot of different interests, but you learn and work from each, with each other to develop these new techniques and find ways of doing things that you didn't even imagine about before. Multi-stakeholder approach. You can no longer just rely on the board of your company or some advisors you have. You have to have a very broad perspective to understand everything that's going to affect your business and the what you do and affected from technology point of view, not the least. We are wave after wave of technologies are hitting us. And we need to be on one of those waves with what we're doing to be successful. And then it's all about collaboration and co-opetition. If you meet a competitor, what do you do? Walk away or learn as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. It's a different way of working. I'm sure there are competitors in this room, and I encourage you to just meet up and talk about what you could do together. Because what you can do together is bigger than what you can do one by one. That's competition. And then, of course, I love to believe that network technology and the abilities of networks of the future is going to be instrumental together with these technologies to transform the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to have been here and enlighten you on 5G and give you inspiration for being part of what we call the Network Society at Ericsson. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.